give you an example. So let me say if I discretize the time derivative using using forward order, and I assume everybody at least know for what forward order is, right? So it basically takes two time steps. So k plus one and k are two consecutive time steps. One is at t, one is at t plus delta t. So this is approximation to di dt at t equal to tk. This, let's write down uh, the numerical solution. ek of i plus 1 plus ek of i minus 1 minus 2 eki plus tau i. Okay. If you look at this equation, there is a condition for which the solution would not self-amplify. The condition is delta t has to be less than delta x squared. Uh, do I need over 2? No, I don't need over 2. So delta t has to be less than delta x squared. All right, because otherwise, because otherwise, I'm going to derive a matrix equation. I'm going to say e to the k plus one. I'm going to define it as e k plus one one, e k plus one two, etc. E k plus one n, let's say minus one. This is going to be a matrix times e to the k. E to the k is the same vector at k plus this vector tau, which is also uh, tau 1, etc., tau i, tau n minus 1, also at time step k. So if you look at the matrix, what the matrix is, okay, uh, you probably need to rearrange the terms uh, in this equation, and this is this is multiplied by delta t. So what you need to do is you need to write down e k plus one is equal to e i k plus delta t over delta x square times minus two e i k plus e i plus one k plus e i minus one k plus uh, delta t tau i k, and uh, the matrix is going to look like very similar to the kind of matrix we derived in the last class, but a little bit different because I have this term and I have a delta t term. So the diagonals, for example, is going to be 1 minus 2 delta t over delta x squared, right? The off diagonals is just going to be delta t over delta x squared. So this is the, the same and the, the lower diagonal is also the same. You can take a look at the this matrix, and you can particularly look at what's called the norm of this matrix. Okay, so let's say this matrix is A. The norm of the matrix the norm of this matrix defines the maximum possible ratio of A times E divided by E, okay? And here, both the numerator and denominator are the norm of a vector. So for example, norm of the vector E, so E is a vector is defined as the length of the vector. So EI1 square plus E2 square plus etc. plus EN minus 1 square. So this, uh, by the way, there are many different norms. This is one of the most commonly seen norm. It's uh, usually called the 2 norm because of the squares are power of 2. And if I'm using 2 norms for the vectors, then the matrix norm is also called the 2 norm matrix norm is inherited from the vector norm. Okay, so now if 
the norm of the matrix is less than one. I'm fine because e k plus one is equal to a times e k plus a truncation error. If the truncation error is small, then the e would be the same order of magnitude as the truncation error. It would not self-amplify. If the norm of the matrix is greater than one, no good. Even if I have a small delta t, uh, even if I have a small tau, my e is going to amplify to infinity. Okay. And the norm of a matrix in MATLAB, you can just type norm. All right. So that's a that's a, a good way to look at the norm in in a matrix. MATLAB. So the definition of the norm is for any vector e. And the maximization is for any e not equal to zero. You are right. So the maximization is over all possible e's. So we are going to, uh, for some of you, this may be the first time we introduce norms. And if you studied linear algebra, you probably also have encountered norms before. But like in, in, in MATLAB, Whenever we have a matrix, let's say if an identity matrix, the norm of A is going to be what? So if A is an identity matrix, what is the maximum possible ratio of AE over E? One, one right? Because AE is going to be equal to E. So norm of A is going to be one. All right? If A is equal to two times identity matrix, what is the norm of A? Two. It's two, right? Because this is going to be two E over, over E. So it's going to be... You need to log A. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, I have a norm equal to two. Yeah, thank you. I was... <laughs> I was freaking out. Uh, Yes? Um, to get in here, um, like, we need to know UA first. So I think the derivation assumes that we like already know U sub A for us to be able to find the matrix for E. Is that right? Or, I mean, if we so is go back one slide. Go back one slide, yes. Yeah, so to find the equation for E, mm -hmm. we assume that we know U sub A on uh, plus one and u sub a or uh, minus one and so on and so forth but in most cases we don't know what like we, we want to solve for u sub a you're right we don't know what u sub a is it's an analytical solution most cases we don't have it and luckily in this error equation although u sub a appears in the beginning so in the green part you see u sub a appears right but once we get to the red equation the e's has no u sub a. The only u sub a appears in which term? Appears in the tau, right? So only the source term, only the tau, has analytical solution in it. And although we don't know what tau is, because the exact value of tau depends on analytical solution, we did tailor a series analysis to know how fast does tau go to zero as I refine delta x. And that is the good thing about the error equation, is that we don't know what tau is, but we know the order of magnitude of tau through Taylor series analysis. And all the other terms does not depend on the analytical solution. All right. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, if I have a, if we have a stable A, can I make the claim that I have a steady state solution for E? Yes. Uh, this 
the answer is yes if tau i does not depend on time. All right. So so tau remember is the difference between the operator, the discrete operator, and the continuous operator operated on the analytical solution. So if the analytical solution reaches a steady state, then yes. If the analytical solution doesn't reach a steady state, for example, in the project when you are controlling the U and you make U sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller, then the analytical solution does not reach a steady state. And uh, your E also would not reach a steady state. But you can bound this magnitude if you can bound the magnitude of tau. All right. Okay, so so the norm of A is going to be something that uh, that you can use to analyze stability of the solution. And this particular matrix, for example, we can uh, we can call this dt dx two. Let's call this as dt over dx square. If this is equal to 0.5, okay, we are going to be making a matrix A that is equal to 1 minus 2 times dt over dx squared in the diagonal. So this is 1 minus 2 times dt dx squared times identity of, let's say, 100. Okay, A is that thing. Oh, it's actually, this is actually 0. And for i goes from 1 to 99, we are going to say a of i, i plus 1 is equal to dt dx square. a of i, i plus 1 and i is also equal to dt dx square. So a is this matrix. If you type norm of a, you get something smaller than 1. But if dt dx square is equal to, let's say, 1.5, you are out of luck because you take a equal to this and uh, you do the same thing. Norm of a is going to be 4.99. And you are going to get, so every time e is amplified by a factor of almost 5, you are going to get infinity after a pretty finite number of time steps. Yes. Did you say the condition for stability was a less than one? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, norm of a is less than one. Right. Norm of a has to be less than one. All right. Any other questions? Okay. So why is the norm not the one in this will be unstable? Why is it going to be unstable? Because because if the norm is greater than 1, that's a actually a good question, I forget to uh, mention that. If the norm is larger than 1, that means there exists an E that makes A times E to be larger than E, right? And no matter, uh, so, so if you look at the solution, uh, the truncation error tau, Tau may have may, may be a linear combination of many components, but if only if there is one component that is lies along that solution, that component is going to be amplified. And over many time steps, if it keeps being amplified, you get an unstable solution. So we will we'll discuss more about that later. So, so the norm of A to be less than 1 is a sufficient but not necessary condition for stability. Okay. There are actually some cases where the norm of A can be larger than 1. You can still be stable. You need an eigenvalue analysis of A to figure out exactly if the scheme is going to be stable or not. You need the maximum eigenvalue to be actually less than 1. So, so in some cases, even if your eigenvalues are all less than one, the norm can still be larger than one. But like uh, usually, the norm is uh, if you can make sure the norm is less than one, you get a uh, you are sure you get a stable scheme.